are black, earning fortunes and being adored by fans. But when the game began, it was almost exclusively white. That is, until one black Briton had the determination, guts and skill to cross the white line. Almost 100 years ago, he was one of the first black professional players, and he was playing at the very highest level. You would think that alone would be enough to guarantee him a place in history. But not only was he a footballing hero, he also became an officer in the British Army, an army that referred to black people as woolly-headed niggers in official correspondence. But he still fought and died for this country, his country. His name was Walter Daniel Tull. Despite an upbringing that was scarred by tragedy, he grew up to be a leader of men and became the first black officer in the British Army. He fought on the Western Front at Passchendaele and the Somme. After leading his men on a daring mission, he was nominated for a military cross, which he never received. He's a British war hero, but if you look at the history books, his name is conspicuously absent. For some reason, his achievements have long been ignored. He's the first black person to be commissioned in the British Army. Surely there should be something, and he should be somebody that everybody has heard of. They didn't want men of colour to join, full stop. What was it they were afraid of? Black officers commanding white men. Every year, we pay our respects to all those who have fallen in battle. But some soldiers are more unknown than others. When I was growing up in Birmingham in the 1970s, I loved stories of British heroes of yesteryear. But as I got older, I realized there weren't any British heroes who looked like me. When I was at school, British history seemed to be entirely white. And as a black kid growing up, the only images that I knew of black British history were slavery and the Windrush migration. Then about 10 years ago, I read about a football match being organized by my local MP, Bernie Grant a memorial match in honor of Walter Tull. And I thought to myself, Walter who? And when I looked into Walter Tull, I found a boy's own hero. He ran out at football grounds across England, ignored the abuse and fought for every ball. And as if that wasn't enough, he then became an officer in the British Army, where he led his white men on missions across enemy lines. He was exactly the black British hero I'd never had as a kid. I became obsessed with Walter Tull. His story both inspired and angered me. And now, 90 years after his death, we can finally put together the pieces of Walter's life and rediscover a true black British hero. So, I'm going on a journey in search of this forgotten hero. It's a journey that will take me from the East End of London, where Walter was brought up as an orphan, to the football grounds where he felt the full force of society's racism. And following in Walter's footsteps, I'll travel to the battlefields of France, where he fought so heroically. and I'll be asking the question, why, to this day, has Walter's bravery gone unrecognized? But my journey begins here in the archives. And digging around in old match reports of the time, I found the first mentions of his name. In 1909, the newspapers reported that Spurs had signed an exciting young forward called Walter Tull in a move they called the catch of the season. And it's by looking in the newspapers that I can begin to get an understanding of the era that shaped Walter. At the beginning of the 1900s, 
Queen Victoria's reign had just come to an end, and Britain had a vast global empire. It was also the era when football was leaving behind its public school origins and becoming a huge spectator sport for the working classes. And the big clubs like Newcastle, Aston Villa and Tottenham Hotspur were always eager to attract new talent. These tattered old pictures show Walter making his home debut in front of 32,000 fans at White Hart Lane. The match report in the Chronicle stated, Tull is very good indeed. Walter was young, handsome, smart, and on his way to becoming a star player at Spurs. He had the world at his very talented feet. For a signing on fee of 10 pounds, Spurs now had one of Britain's first black professional footballers on their books. You'd think that it would be a proud part of the club's history, but the truth is very different. So I'm going to meet a former Spurs star who for many years thought he was the club's first black player. And it was only by chance that Garth Crooks found out about Walter. So Garth, how did you first come across Walter Tull? Well, I first came across Walter Tull by accident, actually. Um, I was at White Hot Lane, We'd finished training and I found myself in the Oak Room, adjacent to the boardroom. And in those days, in the early 80s, they had pictures, you know, pictures going from the 60s right through to the 1900s. And I would, I found myself looking at these pictures and, you know, 61, 62, the famous double winning side, and you go through that and you, and I found myself looking at a picture that dated back to 1909. And he's a young black lad, very handsome looking lad, in a typical team photo, legs crossed, arms folded, hair parted in the middle. I thought, who the hell is he? Because at that time, I thought I was one of the very few black players who played uh, for the Tottenham first team. And um, I looked along the list of names, and I looked, it was a W Toll. Playing for Tottenham Hotspur was very special. It was a big club, it had a great history, you were a part of that. So he was playing right at the very height of football. Spoke to the Tottenham historian. He'd, he'd never heard of him. And thought, this is incredible. Why don't, why have I not heard about this lad? But finding out about Walter is difficult. When I looked in Spurs' official history, I could find no mention of his name seemed as if football had chosen to forget him, and I wanted to know why. So I've come to meet Phil Vasili, the football historian who rediscovered Walter in 1993 and is writing his biography. First of all, how did you discover the story? It was by chance, really, because uh, I was researching the history of black footballers in Britain, and uh, as you do, you get your head down into books and you just look through biographies, uh, annuals, encyclopedias and things, and um, came across uh, in a, an encyclopedia by Morris Goldsworthy, written in the 60s, I think, and it had just a couple of lines, really, about D. Tull, not, not W. D. Tull, um, Tottenham Hotspur, and thinking, well, how come this guy played for Spurs, such a big club, and he, he hadn't been remembered? The more I found out about his life, every tiny piece of information, every scrap of detail captivated me, really, and I thought, how come he's been forgotten, this guy? Was it a rarity to see black players on the pitch in the Edwardian period? There were other black footballers around, but they, they were few and far between. The first black professional in England dates back to the 1880s, when gentleman goalkeeper Arthur Wharton played for Preston North End but Walter was playing when the game was exploding as a spectator sport. Obviously Spurs were a big club at the time and in terms of status and the quality of football that he was playing and, and the quality of footballers he was playing with, that first year at Tottenham was, uh, was just uh, another world for him. With huge crowds watching his every move, Walter was one of the most high profile black men in Edwardian Britain. The fans nicknamed him Darkie Tull 
and I want to know if this was typical of the kind of attitudes he would have been up against. So I put it to Dr. Hakim Adi, who has studied the black presence in Britain. How were black people perceived by the general population? Racism was part of British society, and it's something which, if you like, ref reflected what was going on in the world. Britain was a major colonial power. It had an empire. And the aim was to uphold, if you like, the, the hierarchy which existed in that empire. White was on top, uh, black was at the bottom. So these ideas were around, and they filtered down to ordinary people in the street, through the church, through missionaries, through musical, through popular books and comics, and so on and so forth. We, we have to remember that racism wasn't illegal in Britain until 1965. Racism was entirely legal. Uh, it was only a, a moral or an ethical question. It wasn't a legal question. Walter's story forces us to face some of the prejudices of the past. And amongst the match reports, results and statistics, I've uncovered evidence of the racist abuse that Walter faced. On the 2nd of October, 1909, Tottenham Hotspur came here to Bristol City and Walter played in a game that almost finished his Spurs career. It was here that a section of the crowd of 20,000 consistently jeered and abused the black player. The reporter from the Football Star witnessed the crowd's relentless hostility towards Walter and was outraged by their behaviour. Candidly, Tull has much to contend with on account of his colour. His tactics were absolutely beyond reproach, but he became the butt of ignorant partisan. A section of the spectators made a cowardly attack upon him in language lower than Billingsgate. They were quite ruthless in their targeting of Tull with racist comments and abuse. From the kickoff, it was a rough game. And to the fury of the home crowd, Walter gave as good as he got. There was this black man going around the field knocking over their white players, and they didn't like it, you know, so uh, he got a stick for it. They just gave him uh, a lot of abuse. These days, clubs like Bristol City are fully signed up to initiatives like kick racism out of football. But in the early days of the game, the players and the crowds were rough and ready. So I asked football historian David Goldblatt to describe how the crowds would have reacted when Walter ran out onto the pitch on that fateful Saturday afternoon. Would it be fair to assume that many people watching Walter Tull play would have never seen a black face before? No. Well, football is white. Football is white. You know, you've got a cauldron-like atmosphere. Crowds could be roused to pitch invasions, stone throwing, you know, as well as kind of pretty full-on cussing of one kind or another. I mean, what's separating you and the pitch is hardly anything in most places. You've got people crowded together. Yeah, I mean, people are looking for weakness in the opposition. People are looking for something to pick on. People are looking for a way of getting under the opposition's skin. Bristol's got serious slaving heritage. We know Bristol, you know, to a great extent, its finery and its wealth and its pomp is built on stolen lives and stolen labour. And therefore, you know, you've got a very particular attitude, I would think, uh, a mixture of, you know, guilt and derision, I suspect, um, in attitudes towards black people in Bristol. You know, it's had much more intimate contact with, let's face it, the business end of uh, violent imperialism. Um, that said, we know about the Bristol incident because somebody wrote it down. I mean, I find it hard to believe that Bristol would have been the only place that he was likely to receive that kind of, um, that kind of response. You could, you know, you've gone to Liverpool, you've gone to Manchester, you know, I could imagine just the same thing happening to him. Walter's experiences at Bristol City were one of the first reported instances of racism in football. But it's a problem that's persisted throughout the century. 
I want to know what this abuse does to a young black player. So I've come to Tottenham Hotspur's home ground to speak to a player who's experienced racist abuse and a sports journalist who's reported on racism in the game. How did the abuse, uh, the bigotry, um, how did it manifest itself for you as a player? Well, I always remember when you initially walk out and uh, you run onto the field and, and the, the, the booing, the monkey chanting. Um, but obviously in the 80s in this country, there was also the, the, the banana throwing. I remember one particular game, he sort of ran out of play and I sort of chased it. And then all the supporters were sort of leaning as, as if they were going to jump out at you. And I thought, phew, I took that in the sort of late 70s moving on. You know, imagine Walter Toll, you know, in 1900 to have actually played in that environment. And he'd done that with a, with a, a distinction uh, and, and, a, and I think uh, a humility. He never really was in receipt of the fullest appreciation of what he's done and what he's achieved. But it's great talking about him now because exactly. we can see in a typical Premiership game, Tottenham Arsenal, Tottenham Chelsea, with the representation of black players in yes. those sorts of games, that you've got to trail it back to Walter Tull. Yes. It's a wonderful, poignant story, and I think one that I feel that um, it's, uh, it's had a very, very lasting impression on me. Like many players since, Walter didn't react to the racist abuse. According to the eyewitness report, he seemed to rise above it. Let me tell these Bristol hooligans that Tull is so clean in mind and method as to be a model for all white men who play football. Tull was the best forward on the field. Walter clearly had great composure, courage and resolve. He needed it on the pitch, and in later life, he would need it on the battlefield. And from the very beginning, Walter had to be brave. I've come to Folkestone on the south coast of England. It was here in this small Victorian seaside town that Walter was born. And from the very beginning, Walter didn't have to look far for an inspirational role model. It appears courage and determination ran in the family. His father, Daniel Tull, who was the son of a slave, always stood up for what he believed was right. He was quite a feisty character, I think, Daniel, because he left Barbados because he was badly treated by the man he was apprenticed to as a, as a joiner. And he went round the guy's house and demanded his wages, and uh, I think they exchanged blows. But anyway, for whatever reason, um, he left Barbados. In about 1876, he came to Britain. He worked on a ship, I think, as a carpenter, and ended up in Folkestone. Just like my own father, Walter's dad came to Britain in search of a better life. And though it's rarely mentioned in the history books, there was a small but visible black British presence. Daniel arrived at the end of the 19th century. It's difficult to say exactly how many black people were around, but we're talking about tens of thousands of people. And at that time, there were uh, significant populations of black people, particularly in uh, the port cities like London, Liverpool, Manchester, Glasgow, people would have been aware of a black presence. In Folkestone, it would not have been uh, such, a, such a common sight. Daniel settled in Folkestone, and at the local Methodist church, he met, then married, Alice Palmer, a local white girl. The records don't show how a mixed-race couple were received in a small Victorian town but Daniel earned a regular wage as a skilled carpenter, and the Tolls started a family. Walter was born in April 1888, the couple's fifth child. With his brothers and sisters, he grew up in a close-knit, loving family in this small house in a working-class suburb of Folkestone. And at the local school, he learned how to read and write, and, of course, about the glories of the British Empire. But the poor lad was about to be hit by a succession of tragedies that even Charles Dickens would have struggled to dream up. When Walter was just six years old, his mother died of breast cancer. His father remarried, but three years later, Daniel Tull died of heart disease. 
there was no money to feed the remaining family. The Tull children were devastated and destitute, and the horrors of the workhouse loomed. They were prisons of the poor. They were horrendous institutions. They were the spectre that haunted every working class family, that, that held, that kept working class people in place. You know, people would do anything and everything to keep out of the workhouse. But fortunately, God saved the Tull Boys from the workhouse. Well, not God exactly, but the Methodist Church. Walter and his older brother were sent away from their family home to a Methodist children's orphanage in the grimy East End of London. It's hard to imagine the fear that these young boys must have felt arriving in the world's biggest city in 1898. There were 330 orphan children packed within the walls of the children's home at Bonner Road, most of whom were tough city street kids and Walter's brother wrote about their unhappy introduction to life at the home. A bell rings. It is 6.20 a.m. All the boys in their room rise and dress, after which they make their beds. Being newcomers, we start at the bottom, and naturally the bottom is cleaning of boots, or rather shoes. Not one pair, but all the pairs of the household, the sisters especially. Having finished 15 pairs of shoes, an inspection by the sister is enacted, and if favorable, put away in various lockers. Breakfast came as a happy relief. Life was clearly hard for the Toll Boys, and I met Laura Peters, who has researched Victorian orphanages to try to understand their experience. So Walter and his brother Edward arrive in London. Um, their parents have recently passed away. What sort of uh, experience uh, might they have gone through? I think they would have been very homesick. I think they would have missed the rest of their siblings. They were from a large family. Um, and I think they would probably find that the discipline was quite strict. Um, I think it would have been a real shock um, to Edward and Walter. What were the social connotations of, of the, the label? Orphan. In the 19th century, um, if you were an orphan, you were bereft of happiness, of hope, of joy. Um, so it was, it was a condition not only of being without parents, but being quite miserable and disadvantaged and vulnerable. Being of mixed race would have meant that they were fairly marginalised within society. It was a tough childhood but Walter stood up for himself and settled quickly. In fact, it was his older brother who found life more difficult. I was homesick and a little frightened. Walter, being of a sturdier mold, seemed ready to sample new ways and new means. I'm beginning to get a sense of how difficult life was for these two kids, and how Walter in particular had to develop a thick skin just to survive. Every day, there were prayers, lessons, and work, a disciplined approach that sought to improve the children. These two little boys, they arrived at Bonner Road um, into an uncertain world, an uncertain environment. Um, they'd lost both their parents. It, it must have been a, a huge turning point for both lads. For nearly three years, the brothers were inseparable. But then, life dealt Walter another cruel blow. Both Tull boys had fine voices and sang in the orphanage choir. In 1900, they sang at St. John's Methodist Church in Glasgow. The touring orphanage choir charmed the audience, and Edward Tull was spotted by a middle-class couple who then asked to adopt the boy. On the 8th of November, 1900, Walter's brother left the orphanage and took the train to begin a new life with his new family in Glasgow. Walter was now completely alone. It's obvious he was very, very upset because his uh, schoolwork suffered. There were reports of his behavior getting worse. The years between 1900 and 
about 1903 were very difficult years for Walter. You know, it had been one tragedy after the other. It was a very, very difficult time. But Walter came out fighting. Somehow he found the will to survive such a traumatic childhood. And through the orphanage football team, he found a means of escape. At the age of 20, his determination and talent saw him star for amateur team Clapton Orient. And when I look at him in the Clapton team photo, I see a young man who has somehow found an inner strength. When he joined Spurs, he could have had no way of knowing how much that inner strength would be tested. The racist abuse Walter suffered at Bristol City signaled the end of his Spurs career. He played only seven times for the club in the 1909 season and found himself isolated from the first team and confined to the reserves. It seemed as if Spurs weren't prepared to stand up for their player and Walter became the forgotten man. There were certain people within the Spurs management and directors that just thought it's too much hassle. We, we don't need it. Walter might be a good player, but he's not good for team spirit or morale because we get, you know, we become the subject of abuse and we can do without it. And Walter became uh, a, a victim twice over, a victim of the abuse and then of the consequences of that abuse. In 1911, Walter left Spurs and London behind and joined Northampton Town. His career had been held back for two frustrating seasons, but here in this small industrial town, he had the chance for a new start. This is where Walter lived when he was playing for Northampton. Now, Northampton was nothing like cosmopolitan London, nor was it a port town. In 1911, this was the kind of place where they'd never even seen a black person before. But Walter was black, playing football, scoring goals, and thriving. It seemed after years of turmoil, Walter had finally found a home. But as Northampton moved up the league, the German army moved across Europe. Association football was no longer celebrated as the great British spectator sport. With war fast approaching, it was now seen as a dangerous distraction. When Britain declared war on Germany in August 1914, there was no conscription. The war office needed volunteers and asked every brave British man to stand up and fight for their country. Walter answered the call. On the 21st of December 1914, Walter left his home in Northampton, traveled the 60 miles south to London and presented himself at the recruitment office. He was ready to fight for his country but his country wasn't so sure. A taste of the army's attitude to African people can be found in the 1914 edition of the Manual of Military Law. Under a heading which reads colored troops, it states, troops formed of colored individuals belonging to savage tribes and barbarous races should not be employed in a war between civilized states. They didn't want men of color to join, full stop. The usual ploy uh, used by the recruitment uh, people was, you know, there's a black guy that's just walked in, well, uh, tell him to read the, the uh, eye test from this end of the room, he'll never see it, you know, or kind of, they, they, get, fail him somewhere, use a, a bureaucratic procedure to fail him. Now, they couldn't do it with Walter. When Walter turned up, he was a known man, you know, this was a guy that played for Spurs, played for Northampton, was on cigarette cards in newspapers. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a bit of a face, you know, that walked through the door. So it's difficult to fail him on the medical because he's a fit footballer. Walter became the 55th member of the newly formed and utterly unique 1st Football Battalion. The battalion was a result of the FA and the War Office joining forces to tap into the game's popularity. And this archive gives a rare glimpse of the football stars of the day, training for war. 
So why did the army want to turn players into soldiers? I met military historian Andrew Riddock. What was the formation of the football battalion an attempt to do? When it was set up, it was always envisaged that professional footballers would join and they would be used to encourage the club supporters to join up beside them. Some of these people would have been real heroes of the game. There was an attraction of serving alongside people who they turned up every week to watch. Two major concessions were granted to the footballers' battalion. One was that the height requirement was waived. The height requirement was five foot three. And because a lot of footballers were quite small, this was waived. And the other one was that the players could continue to turn out for their clubs um, until the end of the season. At camps like these, Walter trained with the battalion through the week, then, on Saturdays, travelled across the country to play for Northampton. He stood out in the football battalion and was rapidly promoted to Lance Sergeant. And he played right up until the final game of the season, in what was to be his last appearance as a professional footballer. In November 1915, Walter finished his basic training with the first football, and the battalion boarded a ship at Folkestone and crossed the English Channel, set for war-torn France. This was no longer a game. But no amount of training could have prepared him to face the horrific realities of the Western Front. The war was being fought from muddy trenches that ran for hundreds of miles across northern France. Young men who signed up in search of glory were being slaughtered in their thousands. The Kaiser's army were making advances, and husbands, brothers, sons and teammates died every day in their attempts to stop the German onslaught. As an NCO, Walter would have been taken straight to the front line where he would have experienced firsthand the confusion, the chaos and the carnage, but also the camaraderie and the courage of frontline life. They were sent almost immediately to a really difficult part of the front line around Givenchy and Festubert, which all of the soldiers hated because the trenches, you couldn't build deep trenches because it was very sandy. And so you'd be sheltering behind butts and sandbags and stuff. So, you know, the death rate was high and it was constant kind of exchange of fire. And so those first few months were a, a real shock to Walter. In the freezing, muddy trenches, Walter fought shoulder to shoulder with his comrades in the football battalion. It was a terrifying environment, where to survive, men had to trust one another. And I want to know if even here, Walter was judged by the color of his skin. So I met with military historian Richard Holmes. I want to talk a little bit about the men who would have served alongside Walter. May they have had certain opinions about fighting alongside a, a black man, uh, you know, a, a, as an equal? They might very well have had some reservations, but, I mean, here was a man who was brave, who had a great reputation as a footballer beforehand, and he had a lot going for him. I mean, th th this is a, a crucible which brings men close. And they get closer to one another than you and I could possibly imagine. So most of the people that he soldiered with wouldn't have had those attitudes to race. Would it have been a tremendous shock, what they saw and experienced in those early days? It wasn't simply a shock because you had a chance of being killed and wounded, but the, the physical conditions of the front wet and cold and you would be dirty and you would have lice. And then the experience of trench life and with it sniping and shelling was a shock. 
During a break in hostilities, Walter wrote what he hoped would be a reassuring letter to his guardians at the orphanage, where he described the unnerving mix of tension and adrenaline. For the last three weeks, my battalion has been resting some miles distant from the firing line. But we are now going up to the trenches for a month or so. Afterwards, we shall begin to think of coming home on leave. It is a monotonous life out here when we're supposed to be resting. And most of the boys prefer the excitement of the trenches to the comparative inaction whilst in reserve. We don't know whether Walter's eagerness to see more frontline conflict was bravado, inexperience, or whether he was hiding the true nature of the conflict. But what we do know is that when Walter did finally see what he called the excitement of the trenches, it very nearly destroyed him. On April the 28th, 1916, the slaughter, the panic, and the unrelenting horror of war took its toll on Walter. He was diagnosed with acute mania, what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder, and was removed from the front line. It was his 28th birthday. Very often it was associated with bombardment, hence the expression often used, shell shock, because it was believed that it originated from the concussion effect of a bursting shell, which simply rocked your brain. Actually, not so. We would now call this some form of, of stress reaction to what happened in battle, psychiatric rather than physical. What had happened to Walter is that something wholly shocking, probably connected with artillery bombardment, had knocked him off balance, and he was going to need time to recover. Nobody could ever have envisaged the industrial scale of the horror and carnage of the First World War. If the phrase hell on earth has any meaning, it, it had a meaning then, and I think it broke Walter. The sheer terror that Walter and the other men faced on a daily basis is difficult for my generation to imagine. But even on a warm autumn day, 92 years later, these surviving trenches seem haunted by the ghosts of the past. To be here gives me a real sense of Walter because I don't think you can understand Walter Tell without understanding those months and those years towards the end of his life and what he went through. I feel being here as if, as if it brings me slightly closer to him. I feel I've got a better sense of who he was and how these experiences uh, forged the man. Walter was returned to England to recover. The friends he left behind he would never see again. Half the football battalion fell as casualties on the Somme that summer. By the end of the war, only 30 men remained, and the first football battalion was disbanded. Five months later, Walter returned to the Western Front with a new regiment. His courage in overcoming shell shock and the way he commanded the respect of his men were noted by his commanding officer. And then, in November 1916, something unprecedented happened. Sergeant W.D. Tull, a black working-class man, was recommended for officer training. Up until then, there'd never been a black officer in a UK-based combat regiment before. And this is the part of Walter's story that's always bothered me. Could it really be that the British Army didn't believe that black men were fit to become officers? So I've come here to the National Archive to see if Walter's military record can shed some light on this crucial question. And taking me through his record is the National Archive's military specialist, William Spencer. So what have we got in, fr in front of us here? We have uh, here the, the record of service of Walter Tull. We actually have the, the form for his commission. So we get 
Walter Daniel Toll, date of birth, 28th of April 1888. Whether married, no. Whether of pure European descent, no. Whether British uh, subject by birth or naturalisation, by birth. Right, if I can just come to the, the fourth point that says whether of pure European descent. Uh, of course, Walter answers no to that, but could you clarify what that exactly meant from a military perspective? Basically, what they were, were really trying to do was to grant commissions to people with white people. I think you'll, you'll, it is to put it in, in basic terms. Whilst this form might appear to be very rigid and saying, well, we only want to um, commission white people, they do actually have subsequent questions. It's not that sole question and there's not a form of get out. Was it army policy not to commission anybody who wasn't of pure European uh, descent? The, 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 the rules are there for interpretation. Do you believe a colour bar such as we understand it existed at the period when Walter joined and, and served? It's not categorical, you will not. Of course they want to ask the question. Um, I, I want to get clarification uh, of why whether of pure European descent is, is, is on this form. It seems to me that this is a racist question, right? Um, what I want to do is have a look at the, um, the manual of, of military law. This is the British um, Army's definitive rule book from the time, and it clearly states, commissions in the special reserve of officers are given to qualified candidates who are natural born or naturalized British subjects of pure European descent. Why specifically was that there? The form says, asks a question which, yes, it is probably racist and they want white men to command white troops. What was it they were afraid of? Black officers commanding white men. But why? But why, yes. What I'm trying to get a handle on is why, um, why the army didn't see a black man commanding white troops as a perfectly natural thing for a man of Walter's abilities to do? I think it comes down to the, the, the issue of respect and, and whether a white ordinary soldier would respect a, a black officer. Here in black and white, buried in the army's legal terms, is evidence of just how exceptional Walter Tull was. The rules were broken and the rule book was thrown away in this case and, uh, you know, legally he should, should never have been recommended, never have got past the actual application stage, but because of the quality of the man and the strength of his character, he got through and was appointed to commission on uh, the end of May 1917. The fact that Walter wasn't of pure European descent would have been an absolute prohibition. Now, I don't think for a moment it was right, and one of the things that commissioning someone like Walter Tull did was made a start, a very small start, in reversing that great tide of what I would call instinctive, deep-seated cultural prejudice. Walter may have set a precedent, but the colour bar remained. The next black officer in the British Army wasn't commissioned for another 23 years. In order to understand Walter, um, to make sense of his legacy and his achievements, um, it's important to look at documents like the documents I have in front of me, the documents that state that they didn't want black officers to be commissioned within the UK-based regiments. Um, because then you get an understanding of Walter's special qualities and the fact that he was a man within all that that was able to get his head down, get on with the job and serve with distinction. And I think that's something to be applauded and respected in Walter Tull. Walter was appointed to a commission in the Special Reserve of Officers and spent the spring of 1917 training on Scotland's west coast.
Before returning to the trenches, Walter took the opportunity to be reunited with his brother Edward. Both men had come a long way since they were separated at the orphanage, and Edward had also had to overcome racial prejudice, but had settled in Scotland. Following in Walter's footsteps, I've come to Scotland to track down Edward's remaining family. On my journey, I've examined historical documents, scoured newspaper reports, and marveled at what Walter achieved. But it's difficult getting to know who Walter really was. He didn't get married or have children, and I want to get beyond the official records. So I've come to this small town in the north of Scotland in the hope that Edward's family can give me a sense of what Walter was really like. And I met up with 91-year-old Duncan, who married Edward Tull's daughter and is now the proud keeper of the family archive. That's him. That's so. Edward. Right. And there's Walter on leave, possibly his last leave. There's a family resemblance there, isn't there? That's right. I mean, yes. I, I've, I've mentioned the Tull jawline before. That's very yes, much an evidence right. there, isn't it? Yes. yes. Edward was really one of the finest men I ever knew. Wonderful man. I mean, that fastened on to my enormous regard for Walter. Duncan and his children are Walter's closest surviving family, and their grandfather, Edward, often spoke of his little brother, Walter. How well did you know Edward? Grandpa died when I was four, so right, I didn't okay. know him all that well, but, I mean, I do remember him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember him being a lot of fun and a very kind of warm person. Were they very similar as personalities? Yes, there was a, a, a strength of character and an outlook that was the same, a sort of, you know, moral stability and, and resolve. What abides with me is that certainly right from the beginning he spoke about Walter and about their particular closeness. Was there a sense of pride that his brother was his great sports hero? Those are my, you know, my early memories of both my grandfather Edward uh, and Walter, Walter, you know. Pride that you had a grand uncle that was a professional footballer. Nobody else knew about him then, but, you know, his pictures were on the wall and, you know, it was part of the kind of family history. And uh, as, as children, you know, you, we were always proud of him you know, being in the... Uh, the first black commissioned officer. Having become an officer, Walter led by example and undoubtedly earned the respect of the white men he commanded. He faced the swamp-like mud and mustard gas attacks at Passchendaele. And on the Italian front, Walter showed true courage and leadership. Second Lieutenant Tull was ordered to lead a group of men across the dangerous, fast-flowing river Piave and attack the forward positions of German and Austrian troops. He led from the front and brought his men back without a single casualty. And in amongst the family photos and the war memorabilia, I spotted a remarkable testimony to Walter's bravery that day. What, what about this document here? That is the citation by the commanding officer. Um, after his crossing of the river Piava, I wish to place on record my appreciation of your gallantry and coolness. During the raid, you took the covering party of the main body across and brought them back without a casualty, in spite of heavy fire. I can't imagine the fear that Walter must have had to overcome to lead his men across that icy river on New Year's Day 1918. The fighting around the Piave River was crucial in holding back the Germans. And by leading a successful mission behind enemy lines, Walter was truly heroic. And when a major writes such a glowing citation, a medal usually follows. But Walter never received that medal. His family are well aware of his bravery. But here, amongst his closest relatives, he is remembered not only as a war hero, but as part of a loving family which is perhaps what Walter would have wanted most. This is one of the, perhaps, last photographs taken of them together. He declared, I mean, how much, how close Walter and he were. And I was just very moved by the, by the story. So close was the bond between the Tull brothers 
that before returning to the front line, Walter made plans to move to Scotland after the war, to be closer to Edward, and to resume his football career with Glasgow Rangers. But Walter never got the chance. The war that was supposed to be over by Christmas was now into its third year. And amidst the mud and the shelling, Walter wrote to his brother. Dear Eddie, Fritz was shelling the back area like a demon. And after dodging about from trench to trench, we got fed up and struck across country. Now one mass of shell holes. I pushed for the nearest village. I must have been within 200 yards of the place when I nearly collapsed. After a rest, I proceeded on my journey, reaching the transport lines at about 8 o'clock. I got into bed. All the guns in France couldn't wake me. Love to all. Yours affectionately, Walter. In March 1918, Walter was sent back here to the Somme. It was becoming clear that the Germans were going to lose the war. And in a last desperate attempt to break through Allied lines, the German army launched the Spring Offensive. The fighting became increasingly bloody, and the Allies desperately defended their positions. Walter and his men put up fierce resistance. These fields are where Walter's story ends. On the 25th of March, 1918, an advancing German soldier took aim, pulled the trigger, and fired on a British officer. The bullet hit Walter in the neck, and he fell into the mud of the Somme. He never got up. Almost a month later, the news reached Walter's brother, Edward. When the word had come through, I remember his words, and all that went through his mind was, Walter is dead. My brother Walter is dead. And, you know, that, I always remember him saying that. <laughs> that was the worst moment of my life when I knew my brother Walter was dead. The worst moment of my life. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can imagine. In the midst of the battle, Walter's men risked their lives attempting to recover his body. But they were unsuccessful, and Walter became one of the many whose final resting place remains a muddy field on the Somme. This is the Faubourg Damien Memorial, dedicated to the servicemen whose bodies were never recovered. There are over 33,000 names on these walls, each with their own heartbreaking and heroic stories. But for me, Walter's story is my way of understanding the sacrifice of a generation. They say death doesn't discriminate, and here there is no black and white just a lost generation, all of whom should be remembered. But discrimination continued. When the war ended, there was a victory parade in London. Black soldiers were demobbed early, and only a single battalion took part, hidden at the back of the parade. Three weeks after Walter's death, Walter's brother, Edward, received a letter from a second lieutenant, Picard. Allow me to say how popular he was throughout the battalion. He was brave and conscientious. He had been recommended for the military cross and had certainly earned it. Walter's still waiting for his medal. According to the War Office, 
the Military Cross was to be awarded to junior officers in recognition of gallantry and distinguished services in action. Lieutenant Tull's citation stated he had acted with gallantry and coolness in spite of heavy fire. And as I returned to England, I realized that there was one big question that remained unanswered. Should Tull have received that medal? Yep, in another time and another place, he would have received it. He should receive it. They realize this guy shouldn't be there. You know, and when, they, when this, these papers reached the desk of the, the civil servant in the war office for confirmation, he said, well, why is this guy an officer? He's black, you know, you have to be of pure European descent according to the manual of military law. Without official recognition, Walter's story was neglected, forgotten, and gradually faded from British history. Somebody who was a hero in the First World War, because they happened to be black, nobody talks about him. The first black person to be commissioned in the British Army. Surely there should be something, and he should be somebody that everybody has heard of. It's as if uh, black people and their contribution doesn't exist. Having followed in Walter's footsteps, I returned to my life in London, wondering if Walter was destined to remain a forgotten hero. But my journey didn't end at the war cemeteries in France. Since I started making this program, I've realized that actually, there's a huge interest in the story. Finally, Britain wants to know all about Walter Tom. There's now a growing campaign for Walter to be awarded a posthumous military cross, with over 51 MPs having signed an early day motion. The football world, too, has now recognised his contribution to the game with a memorial in Northampton and the main road to the stadium renamed in his honour. And back in Folkestone, in the very primary school Walter attended, the kids are finally learning about their famous ex-pupil. Oh, what a welcome. Put your hands up if you heard of Walter Tom. <laughs> All three of you, right, we're off to a great start. What advice would you give to Walter? Just if keep, he was leaving the school. Just keep strong. To be strong and just kind of hold all that sadness in. Keep on going and prove that, like, that you're the best. <laughs> to prove all people are equal? Yeah. Absolutely. Our history is largely the stories we tell our children. And unlike when I was growing up, at least now some kids are being taught about a black British hero. Walter's story exposes some uncomfortable truths about British attitudes to race. But it's only by fully understanding the past that we can learn history's lessons. But I'll leave those arguments to the academics. For me, it's enough that we are now finally remembering Walter Tull. And coming up on BBC4, Kwame Kweanwa's powerful play, Walter's War, takes a moving look at Walter Tell's life on the front line and the impossible choices he had to make. Next. You know, you, your hope is that he's going to come back in that door just once, one more time and say, I'm back.